is Heritage Words, a podcast about how we engage with our ancestral languages in new and creative ways. Heritage Words is produced by the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, which raises awareness about Jewish ancestral diversity through the lens of language. I'm your host, Sarah Bunin Benor. We have a very special guest today, Mayim Bialik. Yes, that Mayim Bialik. Mayim is famous for her many TV roles, her diverse books, her leadership in promoting mental health, her thoughtful social media engagement, her PhD in neuroscience, her wonderful podcast, Mayim Bialik's Breakdown, highly recommended, and so much more. But we invited her to the Heritage Words podcast for a completely different reason. In each episode, I interview someone about their connection to the languages spoken by their ancestors and the words they've inherited. Mayim has a special connection to Yiddish, and she's created many short videos about Yiddish words. Mayim, welcome to Heritage Words. Thank you, Grace and Dunk. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> awesome. We're already getting into the Yiddish. So... <laughs> Tell us about your ancestors. Where were they from and when did they immigrate to America? Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I've known you for many years in many different capacities and I really respect your scholarship and um, your leadership in our community. And I'm just really excited to get to talk to you about this because I'm a total language nerd. Um, I took neurolinguistics in college and I do have a minor in Hebrew and Jewish studies. So a lot of my understanding of language also does come from um, some academic background, but the real story is uh, three of my four grandparents were born in Eastern Europe. And uh, my parents were born during World War II. So both of my parents were born during World War II um, in the tenement houses of the South Bronx. And um, so my, my mother's native tongue is Yiddish. And my father, it was the language of my grandparents, but one of my uh, dad's parents was born in New York. So that's my American side, I call it. Um, on my mother's side, it's a mixed marriage because we are um, Litvak and Galiziana on my mother's side, which will be explained more hopefully by you. Um, I speak a mixed dialect of Yiddish because of where they came from. So my grandmother was from um, outside of Munkac, um, which is kind of the Czech-Hungary border, if you want to pull out a map from you know the 30s and check it out. My grandmother came from a village with no electricity, no running water. Um, her, her parents were cigarette peddlers and they were peasants. Um, they died even before my grandmother immigrated, um, just before uh, the Holocaust started. So she came over in the series of pogroms that you know preceded the Holocaust. My mother's father um, was, we don't know, like Polish, Ukrainian, we're not sure. He was from Suwalki, which depending on where the border was, um, he could have been Polish or Ukrainian. You know, my grandparents always reminded me it didn't matter where they lived because you were just Jewish. Like that's what they stamped on your passport and that's what you were. But my grandparents did speak different dialects, which um, again, you can probably explain more where he was from uh, by the fact that I speak a mixed dialect. Um, on my father's side, my grandmother was from Warsaw. She came over as a little girl and um, really didn't admit she was born in Warsaw until, um, I don't know, we sort of forced it out of her. She wanted to be American. And um, she, I didn't hear much as much Yiddish from that side of my family, but my mother, you know, spoke Yiddish with her parents. Um, my mother did not speak English when she started kindergarten, only what her older sister had taught her. But the story is when my mom's older sister went to kindergarten, you know, in 1943 or 44, uh, she spoke no English and kind of showed up, you know, in this public school in the Bronx, like not knowing how to speak. Um, and my grandparents never fully mastered English, like it was adorable, but, um, you know, I grew up with very, very heavy accents on that side of the family in particular. And that was my mama Lushan as well. My mother tongue was Yiddish. That's the language that my mother spoke to me in. Um, and it's the language I spoke to my children in because it's the language of babies and animals. I speak to my cats in Yiddish too sometimes. Oh my goodness. Uh, okay. Wow. Well, I have a few songs that come to mind. One is Koifje Papirosin which is a song about selling cigarettes. And so mm -hmm. maybe your grandmother sang that at some point. That's really um, me. <laughs> and then the other one, um, there are a few songs a bit about Litvox and Galicianers. There's the one, cause I'm a Litvox and she's a Galitz, which is sort <laughs> of like the, you say tomato, I say tomato. That's, right. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I wrote a Yiddish uh, short version of My Fair Lady about the Litvak Galicianer dialect split. Oh, how neat. Yeah, we'll have to share that uh, video on on our uh, show notes. So, um, okay, wow. Um, and your cats, what what are your cats' names? Got to start there. Um, well, currently we have Addy and we have Nermal and we have Francis. So no one has a Yiddish name. But, you know, to me, again, that that was the language of, endearment you know it was the language of sweetness and tenderness and like I said that was my instinct to use that with my kids and mm -hmm. cats so when you say you spoke Yiddish to your kids do you still now um no there's some phrases we still use um they like all their body parts they learned were in Yiddish and when they went for whatever checkup that is when like the doctor or the nurse you know comes in before the pediatrician checkup it must be like 18 months or two years I don't remember and she came in and she's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, go through this list. And I said to her, they're not going to know them in English. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I said, if you want them to pass this exam without you reporting me to child protective services, like this exam will have to be done in Yiddish. And sure enough, I took the list and I went through every body part and we did it in Yiddish and they knew them in Yiddish. Um, so yeah, I used like, you know, phrases I sang to them, you know, some of the Yiddish songs that, that were sung to me. Um, and you know, my kids also signed, we taught them to sign and they were late talkers and signing was, um, helpful. So it was kind of a combination of like signing and Yiddish and, um, and then they grew up with, you know, Yiddish kind of interspersed like the, in English, um, you know, one of the words that we used a lot was like grizz, like don't grizz your brother. And, um, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot of words that I'm saying different that, you know, other people may, but it means to you know, to pester, to annoy, and to, you know, kind of constantly nag. And I overheard once, you know, the Miles must have been like four and Fred was one. And he said, Fred, you just grizz and grizz and grizz. So <laughs> they would use them with each other too. Um, but yeah, I grew up with a pretty broad and interesting vocabulary, I guess. But I didn't learn like formal grammar until college. I studied um, two years of Hebrew in, at UCLA. And then Miriam Karal was my professor for a full year of Yiddish at UCLA. Mm -hmm. But that was the first time that like I understood German grammar and I understood how I'm conjugating and I understood what articles were like, it just all kind of, you know, flowed. And, you know, I have a lot of friends who, for example, spoke Spanish, but couldn't, you know, write it. Um, and I kind of finally like understood like, oh, like you don't think about conjugating verbs. You just think like, this is how I say this, you know? Yeah. So what are some examples of body part words that you used with your kids? Um, well, so we did Hentlech and Fieslech and um, the Oyerin. Um, I mean, we called eyes Egis, like Egelach. Um, we, we called nose Shnagi. Um, mouth, we had, so like Mortgala, or we called it, you know, Mortgi, um, which my Yiddish teacher told me is an unusual um, word for mouth. And she kind of explained why it's usually how you say like, shut your pie hole mouth. So um, I definitely had some, you know, some words that came from a different time in our culture, you know, Eugen Brevin or eyebrows and Kepi is your head. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think what else, those were the main ones. I mean, like who doesn't know Tuchus? Um, yeah, those were kind of the main ones. Uh, I mean, polkies, you know, a lot of people know polkies. Mm -hmm. I mean, fleegies is your chicken wings, but you know, we still use those. Um, yeah, so the, that was kind of how the exam went. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a combination of Yiddish words and then Yinglish words, like you said. Correct, yep. Yeah. So what other types of words have you used in Yiddish with your kids? Um you know, words about, I guess, you know, like behavior category words, um, you know, like, um, I don't know, Th these are just words that also may just be colloquial, you know, to my family, but to, to rice someone is similar to grizzing them. Um, you know, uh, oh, uh, teeth, I forgot. Um, we would say tsandies um, for teeth, but I know that you could also say tsandies. So like we also had, uh, you know, these two dialects kept popping up. Um, you know, our dishes were milchig, milchig and fleischig. That's how I say it. Um, I say geschrei, like for a cry, not geschrei. Um, and um, like pushka pishka. And you might be thinking, why do you know what a pushka or a pishka is? Is because there always was one in our house where you collected money for tzedakah. So 
Um, I've tried to divide the categories. I think that the words from my grandmother related to like housekeeping and food and the things related to my grandfather were more behavioral or disciplinary, which I think you know, kind of, you know, is sort of interesting to track what came from what. Um, you know, obviously a lot of our, our davening, you know, a lot of our praying, like we daven Ashkenazi. So, um, you know, there's definitely, it feels Yiddish when we pray, we say the and things like that. Um, and my kids, you know, they know Shabbos and they know um, Lech Benching and they know, you know, Benching. They know, um, yeah, a lot of uh, food stuff um, and, and cooking stuff, um, you know, comes from um, more more Yiddish than Hebrew. And I'm trying to think what else, you know, I also speak Hebrew. So they also learned a smattering, you know, like Mechmasayim and Mishkafayim. And, you know, I would teach them. Uh, different clothing and things like that. And just sort of like whatever came to me, if I didn't have the Yiddish vocabulary, I would often fill it in uh, with Hebrew. And also just from studying Yiddish and learning, you know, the approximately 30%, you know, that comes from Hebrew and like being able to see why we pronounce it Chaneke, you know, even though it's spelled Chaneke, um, you know, things like that. So yeah, all my kids sort of holidays, you know, it was, it was Sukkot and it was, um, I'm trying to think of other, you know, a shalachmanes, like, you know, they had to sort of um, adjust to hearing non Yiddishisms for a lot of it. And my older son for his bar mitzvah, you know, we talked about it and um, Shep Rosenman, who's a close, you know, family friend and a mentor to me, um, he tutored both my boys for their bar mitzvahs. And he's like, what do we do? And I said, we, we teach them to daven like a Yiddish speaker, because that's how I daven. That's how I was, you know, um, Taught and you know I can switch it. When I used to lead services at UCLA, Rabbi Chaim Seidler Feller would, who is a Yiddish speaker, you know, would say like we need to do you know classic uh, Hebrew when we're leading a congregation. But then when I you know for example do haftarah or if I uh, if I bench you know if I um, you know if if I do the praying from the Torah or haftarah, all my brachas are you know the way that I would do them. So your did your boys end up doing it in the Ashkenazi style? Yeah, and they still do. My older one, when he when he lanes, um, he still lanes with an Ashkenazi. We call ourselves the sufferers because the letter is saf. <laughs> okay. Well, wow. Wow. So way to represent uh Ashkenazi. <laughs> uh yeah, and it's interesting because most Ashkenazi Jews do do the more Israeli influenced pronunciation, sure. even though they're Ashkenazi. Uh, why do you think your family maintained that longer than other families? Um, you know, I think, I mean, I don't know. I think it's funny because the word Ashkenazi then feels like it takes on a different, um, you know, a different connotation when you, because like if if you get an art scroll sitter and it says Ashkenaz, it has all the safs, you know, the way that let's say I daven and then the Sephardic version, right, is what is the the regular or the more kind of, you know, traditional Hebrew um but yeah, so it's kind of like you can hear Ashkenazi people daven Sephardic, but you won't hear Sephardic people daven Ashkenazi. Yeah. Um, I think for me, you know, I had a real affection for Yiddish and it. I think it stayed in my house maybe longer than other people. Um, the fact that I, um, you know, had learned enough that I wanted to use it with my kids. I think it kind of kept, you know, um, going. And, and, you know, I feel like this is probably one of the only places that I would talk about it. Like there's a real tenderness I feel for the way my grandparents davened. Um, my mother's father was a lechazen. And so he took tremendous pride, you know, in the way that he chanted and the way that he sang and he had a beautiful voice. And, um, you know, for me, there's, there's a heritage aspect, you know, to the way like davening the way that, that we daven, like that's the way it was told to us. So it's kind of like, that's, that's my Torah, you know, that's the way it's been passed on to me. And, um, you know, for better or worse, like that's the language of love. My grandparents otherwise wouldn't have met. I mean, especially coming from two different communities like they did. Um, and I don't know if they were particularly in love, to be honest with you, they met at night school, you know, in America and like, you just kind of paired up with whoever was, you know, able to take care of you. My grandmother moved into, you know, an apartment with my grandfather and his parents. Um, she was an orphan, you know, by that point and a young woman. So, but that was the only language that they spoke, you know, in common. Um, mm -hmm. 
grandmother spoke, I think, three or four other languages because growing up where she did, she she could speak Russian, she could speak Hungarian, and um, she was ethnically Hungarian actually. But um, you know, Yiddish it's a unifying language. It's what unified a culture of people, and it does. It feels very close to me when I think of it like that. Hebrew is the global language of the Jewish people. There's no question about it. Um, but you know, for a people that was bottlenecked the way we were, and a people that you know um, was what w- for a people that was put through you know what we were put through historically um this is that language you know and um i i hail from Chaim Nachman Bialik you know who who wrote in hebrew even though he spoke in yiddish right um that was our language well he wrote in both in yiddish and hebrew. correct correct but it was very it was um you know i was raised that it was this powerful statement to say i can write you know in this language that is the language that we have voted is going to be the language of our country you know um yeah. and i think it would be such a different world if yiddish were the national language of israel it would be a very different world um so what is your relationship was he your great great Grandpa? He's my great grandfather's first cousin, which means I'm his brother's line. So if you trace it up, he had a brother and I'm from his brother's line. Got it. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about your name. So your last name Bialik means white. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any sense of how your family got that as their hereditary surname? Um, you know, I, I was told that many people who hailed from the Bialystok region, you know, like the, the Bialystok village, and there's a forest there. And if you've seen the movie Defiance, which is fantastic, it's Leah Schreiber, Schreiber and um, uh, Daniel, what's his name? I'm an old person. He played James Bond, Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig and Leah Schreiber um, play two brothers from the Bialystok, you know, village and, and, um, so that's apparently the region that we came from or that our name was from. Um, but Chaim Nachman Bialik's story is what I assume mine was, which is more the Odessa route. But yeah, that's what I'm told. I mean, I'm fair, but actually my dad, who is the Bialik, um, was was quite dark. My mom actually thought he was Italian when she met him and not Jewish. Um, he looks more kind of Ukrainian um, and, and you know, had black hair and very, very dark eyes and olive skin and was very dark, as was my grandfather. So I don't know, but somewhere we got named that. I'm something like 99.9% you know, Jewish. So um, whatever my you know, mixed breed is, uh, the, the name obviously hailed from a fair people or from that region. Yeah, right. So I think it could have been either of those. Um, it's It could be a geographic name or a characteristic name. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what about your first name, Mayim? It's a Hebrew word meaning water. How did you get right. that as so um, I got it for a Yiddish reason, which again, this feels like the easiest place to explain it because I think people will get it. Um, I'm named for my great grandmother. That's my father's mother's mother. And her name was Mariam, which was kind of a Yiddish version of Miriam. And um, the grandchildren had trouble pronouncing Mariam. So they just called her Mayam. It was not because it was water. They weren't Hebrew speakers. They probably did not realize that at the time. Um, so she went by Bubby Mayam, and that's what everyone in my family called her. I never got to meet her, um, but she was called Bubby Mayam. And um, my parents, I was born in 1975. My parents were hippies, and um, it was, you know, they thought it was cool. Everybody thought they were crazy. Um, my middle name is Chaya, um, which is for um, my great grandmother on the other side, Chaya Liba. Um, but yeah, I'm Mayam Chaya, I'm living water, if you'd like. Um, and I was called Vilda Chaya. That was one of my nicknames as a child. It was a wild beast. So Chaya worked for that. Um, but, you know, my parents thought it would be cool. And, it, you know, it's, it was very, 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 very commonly mispronounced my entire life. It's still mispronounced a lot. But I will say there's so many more unusual names and ethnic names in our culture now that um, I think, I don't know, it, it, seems to be less hard for people, but it never occurred to me to change it. Um, I was teased a lot, you know, um, people called me toilet water and it wasn't very kind. Um, and my dad would call me Mari, which was like short for Mariam. That was one mm-hmm. of my nicknames. And I actually met an, and I, I think she was Scottish. I had a Scottish friend in junior high whose name was Mari and it was spelled M-A-I-R-I. And it was so funny because like that was my nickname, obviously for a different reason, but it was kind of neat. So yeah, my dad called me Mari as a nickname. 
Um, and then I was called Mai and I was called Mai Mai. Uh, my brother's name is Isaac. So he was I and I was Mai. So did you ever think of your name as meaning white water? <laughs> no, never thought of that because I always just thought of my first and middle name. And also, you know, really appreciate that in Hebrew, my name is my you know, as my Chaya, I'm the child of my parents. So while my last name is incredibly significant and really important to me, and obviously, you know, there's a Bialik street in every, pretty much every major city in Israel. Um, and that's a huge part of my identity. I also, you know, really strongly identify as, you know, my Chaya, the daughter of my parents. Mm. So when you're called to the Torah, how are you called? I'm called as my Chaya, Bas, my mother's Bryna Basha, and my father was Binyomin Yidl. Uh, I've been told those are the most Jewish names you can have for parents <laughs> in the universe. Most um, Yiddish, yeah. <laughs> the most Very Yiddish, like super Jewy name. Um, and then, you know, my boys have, um, you know, my, my older son is Meyer, um, not Mayer, not Meir, but Meyer. Um, he's Meyer Rosh. He was born between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And Rosh was a son of Benjamin in the Torah. And my father is the tribe of Benjamin, we figured, because uh, of his name. So anyway, I have a Meyer Rosh. And then my younger one is Ephraim Hirsch uh, for my grandfather, who is Ephraim Tzvi Hirsch. That's how they often did it. If you were named for an animal, you got the Hebrew and the Yiddish. So yeah, my kids technically have you know more Yiddish names. Um, and my ex-husband is Michael Ephraim. So pretty, pretty standard issue. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, pretty common today for people our age to have Yiddish names as their ritual name. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder though, if that's going to last if, in the next generation. Um, but it sounds like yeah. you need for your kids. I um, tried. Yeah. I really wanted to keep it going with my kids. And I do have friends, you know, who really wanted to give their kids like Israeli names or, you know, which I think is beautiful. And so much of my family is in Israel. So I've heard I mean, I have dozens and dozens of cousins. And so I've heard every combination of, of you know, usually Hebrew or more traditional Hebrew names, even though, you know, um, some of them are still Yiddish speakers, the older generation. Yeah. So let's talk more about your heritage words, words that have been passed down the generations to you. Um, so we talked about body parts in terms of endearment. Um, what are some other heritage words? Insult. Ah, oh, insult. <laughs> so let's go there. Okay. Tell us about some of the insults. I mean... So one, um, you know, um, if you did something really foolish, you were called a Katzen cup, a cat head, a head like a cat, which I think cats are very smart. Um, but that was, it was, you know, my parents, um, you know, thankfully were not heavy name callers. Um, you know, I did not experience, thank God, like that kind of name calling, but it, it was usually, it was a combination of English and Yiddish. Like th this is, you know, what are you such a Katzen cup? Like this is, you know, I mean, it was really like that would happen. Um, so yeah, a lot of insults also, you know, thrown around about other people. Um, and, you know, a very specific part, you know, of my Yiddish speaking culture was around the names that we give other people. So I'd, I'd love to not repeat many of them because um, it's, it's not a particularly, you know, flattering part of linguistic history. But I do think it's interesting that my parents, you know, would talk about the culture that they were raised in where, you know, being given monikers was was not always seen as as harassment, meaning a lot of people took on those monikers, um, you know, because they were, you know, an identifying feature of a very colorful language and culture. So I'm not trying to excuse it. That's not for me to do. But um, I will say that just there's a category of words there, cuts and cup being one of the kindest. <laughs> Well, interesting. And and you're into cats. So it, it's yes, um, I feel like it's revenge. It's revenge on all the times I was called cats and cup. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Do you consider Yiddish to be an endangered language? Yes. I mean, you'd be the appropriate person to tell me if I'm right or wrong. But yes. Well, so technically, it's not because a lot of Hasidic children speak it. That's and the true. way you define a, a language as being endangered is that it's not being passed down the generations. That's um, true. I do hear Yiddish spoken on the streets of, you know, uh, Borough Park and such. Yeah. Yeah. And in most other episodes of Heritage Words so far, we've focused on endangered Jewish languages like Judeo-Arabic, Bukharian, Juhuri, and Ladino. Yeah. And so Yiddish isn't technically endangered, but 
many Jews experience it as endangered because mm -hmm. their great grandparents spoke it and they don't. So, uh, and they use Yiddish not as a vernacular, but in post vernacular ways. Um, but it sounds like your family still kind of uses Yiddish a little bit as a vernacular, but you know, mostly it seems like when you are speaking to your kids, you're mostly speaking English with a bunch of words from Yiddish, right? Yeah, I mean, like, right, the sentence, like, Vilsta Wasser, like, you know, do you want water? Like, that's always going to come out like that. Um, so, yeah, it also kind of served as a secret language when my kids were little, um, you know, Vilsta Gekaki, like, do you need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> like, do you need to, you know, go number two? Kind of was, was code language. But yeah, at this point, um, I don't know that they will use it unless they academically, you know, study it. And I think also just in my defense, the reason that I think some normal people, meaning non-academics, think that it's endangered is, you know, the impact of the Holocaust on this language and our culture feels so enormously significant. And it is so enormously significant that I think for me, um, some of that gets, you know, collapsed in there. And like, you know, I have I'm looking at my bookshelf, you know, I have like my Yiddish section, you know, and I have my Hebrew section. Uh, but there, for me, the, you know, I, I'm only alive because my grandparents had to flee, right? I'm only alive because they survived. Uh, but, but it also feels like there was a whole other world that was going on that was vibrant. And, you know, just even the number of Yiddish speaking newspapers in, you know, in the Lower East Side and that were published here in America before the Holocaust, like it, there's a tremendous sense of loss for me around that culture. And I think that's also, you know, why I do have such affection for it. I mean, I used to listen to the Klezmatics just like it was normal music. My kids would sing along to Klezmatics and you know, I went to those concerts. So there's so many great opportunities for Yiddish Kite, but it is very different than if it was just in your home all the time. Absolutely. And that's why I think even if it's not technically endangered, it really is experienced as endangered. Right. And and it, it is disappearing in certain circles. Well, in most circles beyond the Hasidic community. And right. I'm wondering what you think about that. Does that make you sad? Um, it makes me sad because a lot of people don't have connection with the Hasidic community and the Hasidic community. And, you know, some of my family is Hasidic. So I, um, you know, I, I know a bit about this community. It's a community that's not looking to engage with the outside world. Like, check out our Yiddish, you know, <laughs> look what we do. So um, I think that's also why it might feel kind of more endangered because the community that is using it is a, um, you know, an inclusive community and a protected community for a lot of, you know, good reasons. And um, so, yeah, I think um, it makes me sad that, um, you know, there's so many aspects of the language and the culture surrounding the language that are lost. Like when I tell people what the word fishimult means, you know, that like a peach when it's like, it's not overripe, it's like kind of mealy and dry and you get to the pit and there's like weirdness. You know, that's how you describe Fischimmelt. And in Yiddish, we just have one word, it's Fischimmelt, you know? Um, so to me, like that's a very useful word. There's so many other, you know, useful uh, words. So I, I love it as a language, um, you know, to be tittering about something, like to be so excited that you're like a little bit vibrating and a little bit like dancing inside, like it's a special word, right? It's a special language and it doesn't exist other places. Um, and I think for my kids, um, you know, I, I, I'm I grateful that I was able to raise them even in a modified way with other languages. You know, they also grew up with Hebrew and, um, uh, but but for me, it is it's a it's a window into an aspect of history that a lot of their peers don't have either. You know, my grandparents were older. My parents are a little older. I'm a little older than some parents. So, you know, my kids were kind of touched by Yiddish in the way that a lot of their peers even weren't. Yeah, right. It, it is pretty unusual for kids in their generation to have access to that. Um, but you're also doing a lot to kind of counter its endangerment with your with your uh, social media engagement, your your Yiddish word of the week videos. Um, how did you start doing that? Um, I think probably someone on my social media team saw something that like, oh, people do this and it would be fun. Um, I think I probably started actually, I think it may have started when I was doing stuff with Kveller. Um, I used to write for Kveller.com and actually my early writing, you know, even before I was on Big Bang Theory, when I was just like a mom blogger, um, I did a lot of writing uh, for 
for Kveller and a lot about Jewish observance and uh, also about kind of orthodoxy and sort of dispelling some myths there. Um, but yeah, I think when they started producing video content, it was one of the things that we did and I sort of kept it going. And then I've done stuff with Modi, you know, the, the comedian. Uh, I mean, his knowledge of Yiddish is it's it's out of this world like it makes me sound like i don't know yiddish at all yeah. you know he's right. such a beautiful linguist around it if, if people don't know who modi is please look up modi rosenfeld um but yeah so i've done some with him and and um i think especially i'll be honest like post october 7th like it feels certain aspects of being jewish feel scary or like am i imposing too much on your knowledge of me you know if i tell you this about me being jewish so to me, Yiddish kind of is a way to remind myself of my identity, you know, even beyond that of being a Jew, um, a Zionist, you know, I'm a Yiddish speaker. There's particularity to my experience, just like there's particularity to the experience of North African Jews or Chinese Jews or Indian Jews or South American Jews or Australian Jews, right? Um, we all have different aspects to us. And for me, um, you know, it's a part of like, you know, I don't mean to overstate it, but, you know, it's like my fighting spirit like that's my yiddish spirit is um we exist we have a right to exist and we have a right to exist in all different flavors and colors and shapes and sizes um and variations so but you don't have a hebrew word of the week series right? <laughs> just doing the yiddish so it, it, is no it like for me i feel like it's a niche market you know yeah. the yiddish market um, and sometimes we've actually, I think a couple times we've done ones that also, you know, work in Hebrew or have a different Hebrew pronunciation. Um, but, but yeah, for me, my, my weapon of choice is Hebrew, is, my weapon of choice is Yiddish. And do you feel like that helps to keep it alive, to spread awareness about it? Like yeah. what is it? Golden. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of nostalgia and especially for women who grew up watching me on TV who might be my age or around my age. Um, a lot of us were kind of like the last ones to hear Yiddish. And, you know, I think I heard it maybe more than others. But, you know, for many people, it's like, oh, my grandmother used to say that my grandfather used to say that, you know, so um, there's a real kind of sweetness to that. And um, and I think also, you know, there's something kind of like I'm not afraid. Right. I'm not afraid to show that this is a part of me as a Jew is um, Yiddish. And there's room for that. You know, I also can speak Hebrew. I also can value that. I don't have to choose, you know? And I think that's brings up a lot of issues for us, especially post October 7th. Which side are you choosing? Are you on this side or are you on that side, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of those places where like, I, I, I don't have to choose. Like Yiddish is still part of my linguistic identity and it's what formed me. And, um, and also I support, you know, Israel's right to exist and speak Hebrew when I need to. Amen. Uh, <laughs> so, so what else do you wanna tell us about your connections to Jewish languages? Um, well, I'll tell kind of a sweet story. Both my kids were were late talkers, um, but my younger one in particular was named for my grandfather, who was the Lehazen. And um, my grandfather was a very complicated personality. He never stopped talking, and he would talk until people literally would like leave the room or the house or cry. And he was very he was um, very persistent. You know, he he and my grandmother both didn't really have an advanced education. You know, they they came from a very different time. And I said to my mother before my child was born, I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. Um, and I said to her, you know, if it's a boy, you know, your father is the next to name for, how would you feel about that? And she said, I would support that. And I said, okay, so it was a boy and we named him Ephraim Hirsch, Ephraim Tzvi Hirsch. And he didn't speak and he didn't speak for like four and a half years. And I'm not exaggerating. He didn't speak. Um, I mean, he had words, obviously he had, he had signs. He wasn't particularly frustrated but a real late bloomer in the speaking department. And um, he sang before he spoke. Mm. And he would sing, Vos given is given, unishto, and he would sing Yiddish. And what was fascinating is when he started speaking, it was clear that he was listening, you know, to all of the things, right? And of course, like, as a neuroscientist, I knew this. As a generic mom, as like a mama bear, you know these things, right? The child can hear us even if we don't hear them speaking back. But this was years, right? And of course, I always spoke to him with respect. I always assumed he understood. I wanted him to understand. But the notion that he had absorbed entire Yiddish songs without ever reciting them was 
fascinating to me. It was fascinating. And especially that he was named for a man who didn't shut up and who sang all the time, you know, that he would produce songs in Yiddish after me never teaching them to him. Like it showed me the power, you know, the power of the mother's connection with the child in particular around how we speak to them and what we sing to them. Um, and it was just so moving also to hear this like tiny child singing, what's gone is gone and you can't get it back and you can try, but you're never gonna be young again. I mean, these are the words like, and that was just the song that my grandfather always sang, you know, that I would sing to him. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just, a, you know, particularly kind of unique and, you know, special memory. And um, now he doesn't really want, he doesn't like when I tell people that story, but I don't think that he'll be listening to this. Um, uh, as well, what, what are some uh, others? that he sang or that you sang to him? Um, you know, I have a couple Yiddish songbooks. Um, so like Eifin Pripachuk, you know, I have like some of those, you know, some of the sort of classics. Um, uh, my Yiddish Amamala, like that was like, that was one that he loved. Um, you know, my, they had records. My grandfather had a record player. And so he would play some of these. Um, I'm trying to think what else, you know, we were also big fans of Jackie Mason which I know sounds kind of funny, but it's Yiddish adjacent, you know, in that it was like a comedian yeah. that like spoke our language, you know, and my parents would take us to see Jackie Mason. It was like the greatest thing I had ever experienced. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think, I mean, Tumbala Laika, I also learned we had an incredible music teacher, Miss um, Engel, and she taught us Tumbala Laika. And then I also heard it. And then when I finally learned the Yiddish and then my older son is a fiddle player. We call it fiddle because if you're Yiddish, you say fiddle, not violin. Um, and uh, he would play tumbala laika on the. I mean, it was like full circle, you know, all of the things. So um, I should yeah. invite him to join my klezmer band. Oh, I mean, I I love klezmer. Um, and at my wedding, you know, we had a four piece klezmer band which split up in twos for the groom's tish and for the uh -huh. you know. Panim. So um yeah, I absolutely love Klezmer. I'll have to tell him that he needs to connect yeah. with you. Well, we did too. Actually, that's how I got into Yiddish through Klezmer. Wow. Because I the Klezmer band at my bat mitzvah. And then I was I played violin since I was four. Wow. And, and I took Klezmer violin lessons after my bat mitzvah. Yeah, and, then, <laughs> yeah, and I got into Yiddish culture through that. Amazing. Really amazing. Um, I think those are kind of the highlights. I mean, it's really nice to get to talk about it. You know, it feels like it's, um, you know, it's a nod to my, my grandparents, um, and also to my mom and, and my, my aunt, my mom's older sister, who was the one to try and teach the house English, you know, um, she kind of bore the brunt of being the American in the house, you know, and she was only a couple of years older than my mom. So, um, you know, there was a really, really fascinating aspect of that. And, you know, another aspect of sort of the the folklore around, you know, Yiddish, which I'd like to share. My mother was very sick as a child. She had a neurological condition. Um, we now know it's called Sydenham's Korea. It was called St. Vitus Dance in the 1940s. And it's a choreotic disorder. So kind of like Huntington's, you know, it had like a lot of spastic movements and she was taken out of school for a year. And my grandparents really didn't believe in, in Western medicine. Um, they would do cupping for my mom and her sisters. Like this was just like a normal thing you did. You know, you did like Shlag Kapuras on, you know, before Yom Kippur, they would swing a dead chicken over her head, you know, just like things that happened in her house. But when my mother was sick, um, they did essentially an exorcism you know, like the Dybbuk style. Um, and they had people come and they renamed her so that the evil spirits wouldn't find her. Um, you know, so there was like Alta Brainabasha and then regular Brainabasha, you know. Uh, but just the notion that my mother didn't understand what all these women were coming to her bedside, blessing her for fertility, you know, all these things. She was like seven or eight years old at the time. Um, but, you know, those kind of things remind me that like Yiddish was part of an entire culture. It wasn't just the language, you know, that they spoke. Um, it was an entire culture that was built around the Eastern European communities that you came from um, and all the things around that. It's just so fascinating to me, like really cinematic, right? Like to live through those kinds of times with a language, a culture, a different way to function. Um, it's just really fascinating to me. Well, I feel that you're really lucky that these things got passed down the generations to you, not just the words, but the stories and, and the significance of the words and the names and and you you you've really shown our audience that it, language is connected to 
the heart of a community and a culture. And it's not just the words, it's it's the stories behind them and the um, the layers of history behind them. Yeah. And also just, you know, to your note, it's not that I don't feel that when I'm in a Hasidic community, um, but it's it's different, you know, it's different than my family. And some of my family is Hasidic. And I guess that feels in some ways the most authentic, right, to the Yiddish experience. Um, but yeah, my great aunt passed away. My Tante Fagi passed away. Um, she died, you know, at almost 100 um, during COVID in mm -hmm. Brooklyn. And we used mm -hmm. to say she survived the Nazis. She hid in Budapest as a Gentile during the war. She survived the Nazis, but did not survive COVID in, you know, um, in Brooklyn. And, um, you know, she was the last one with that accent. You know, she was the last one who would, you know, shove food on the table, even if I was not hungry, you know, and she was the last one who sort of had that Yiddish as so much part of her. Um, so, yeah, definitely a, a generation away, but um, I try and keep it going. And I appreciate all that you do um, to keep it going and to keep conversation about it going as well. Well, thank you, Mayim. This has been a great conversation. And thank you again for all the great work that you do in your multivaried life. Thank you. And Zygazen, that's what we say. <laughs> thank you.